Hello everyone. In this brief presentation, we are going to cover the approaches to selecting the right GAN device for your applications with some illustrated examples. As a disclaimer, we are focusing on presenting the methodology or considerations and the results that are presented are based on certain assumptions. So in case for your application, the assumptions may not apply, your results may vary, but the methodology is still applicable. With that caveat, let's first list the differences between silicon MOSFETs and GAN MOSFETs to appreciate the challenge of selecting the right GAN. Of course, uh, as power electronics designers, you may be more familiar with silicon MOSFETs uh, in terms of parametric trade-offs uh, with their established packages, what kind of cooling techniques are required and what kind of gate drive uh, circuits are required. And uh, generally, there is a very mature cost regime with silicon MOSFETs. When you go to GAN MOSFETs, it is a relatively new device. Uh, it offers significant benefits in terms of uh, pushing the power envelope for a given RDS on. But for taking advantage of that, you have to understand the different parametric trade-offs. Uh, possibly different cooling approach because of the new packages and the gate drive circuitry required for a GAN MOSFET. And with that, you may be able to get to a good cost to performance uh, trade-off with GAN devices and that will help your project. Here's the portfolio of TAGO's GAN devices that cover a wide range of applications as we will see next. Uh, these are available in small 5x7 QFN package uh, that is thermally efficient and also each of these devices available with integrated driver version. And uh, we will explore the trade-offs of choosing the right device amongst those for a given example. And we'll, start, we'll focus on uh, different PFC topologies to illustrate that example. We start with the critical mode uh, boost topology, which is very common at low power levels. And schematics are shown here, and the typical waveforms for inductor and switch are shown here. The main thing to remember is that uh, the inductor current uh, comes back to zero every switching cycle. So it is variable frequency, but zero voltage turn on. Before we get into the tables here that are shown, showing the power level for each of our devices, we want to spell out some uh, assumptions that are made for these calculations. First, the average frequency for the device uh, switching loss calculations is assumed to be 100 kilohertz based on design experience. We assume no fan cooling, which is the worst case condition, but very common for low power applications. And we assume the ambient and junction temperatures of 70 degrees and 120 degrees C, respectively. Finally, based on our experience of designing many high power density boards, we identify the maximum power dissipation with each of our devices with PCB uh, heat dissipation without any fan cooling, as shown here. So that ranges from 2 watts to 2.5 watts. With that background, let's shift our attention to the tables on the left. What we look at is uh, for each of our devices, what is the maximum power for a given uh, topology, input voltage range, and number of devices in parallel. So we're actually flipping the question from what is the right device for my application to which of our devices can give uh, maximum power as shown here. But that's ultimately answering the same question. So moving from high RDS on to low RDS on, as you can anticipate, the power level increases. More interestingly, uh, when you go from one uh, device to two devices in parallel, power level more than doubles. That's because you are getting both thermal and current sharing advantages. And that, that is something to keep in mind even though paralleling has its own uh, set of challenges and we will not uh, get into those here. Another thing to notice is that when you go from universal input range, that is the top table, to a single input range, either 120 volts or 230 volts AC, 
you can again expect an increase in power level for a given RDS on and uh, that also shows that uh, shows more prominently or more more prominently in uh, 230 volt application because the current levels are lower. One other thing to note here is that uh, this power levels that are shown uh, for say let's say 180 milliohms as an example, the 300 watts uh, that's available with uh, single input range is about 20 to 30 percent higher than similarly rated RDS on rated uh, MOSFET device. Uh, so that's one of the benefits that GAN provides in this type of applications. And as you go to higher power levels, this actually becomes more pronounced. When we shift our attention to the CCM boost PFC with the similar topology as the CRM, but a significantly different current waveform, uh, what we will see is that the peak and RMS currents are lower, and as a result, the conduction losses will be lower. However, you will notice a somewhat counterintuitive uh, result that may appear counterintuitive at first, where the power levels available from a single device are lower compared to critical mode uh, uh, boost topology, and that is attributable to the higher switching losses associated with CCM topology, where ZVS turn on is not possible. However, when you go to higher power levels, this results significantly improve, and that is one of the reasons CCM is more applicable at higher power levels. Next, uh, we shift our attention to the totem pole PFC, which helps eliminate the input bridge rectifier as well as the output boost diode, uh, and replaces those elements with active switches. So you now have two GAN devices in what is known as the fast leg and two uh, silicon MOSFETs in what is known as the uh, slow leg. What is important to note is that in totem pole PFC, there is no scope to replace this uh, devices, the GAN devices, with any silicon MOSFET because silicon MOSFETs come with a body diode which has got significantly high reverse recovery and that's not suitable for this application. When you go to uh, the power levels, what is interesting to note is now we have actually increased the power capability for a given RDS on. And that is despite the fact that each of this device is doubling as a switching device in half the uh, line cycle and a rectifier device in half the line cycle. So we are actually extracting a lot of value out of these devices and uh, able to get high power with totem pole PFC. Finally, uh, when you go to CCM version of the totem pole PFC with similar uh, current waveforms as in the CCM boost, you notice that uh, we have similar patterns where at low powers, the power capability does reduce, but as you go to higher power levels, the power capability of uh, CCM totem pole is higher than the CRM totem pole PFC. So in this brief presentation, we have provided the examples of applicable power limits for each of the Tagore GAN devices, and thus illustrated a few points. First, uh, choosing the right GAN device requires different considerations than choosing silicon MOSFETs. In general, the GAN devices help extend the ex applicable power range for a given RDS on device compared to a comparable silicon MOSFET for the most stringent thermal conditions. As the thermal conditions improve, the benefits of GAN become even more pronounced. And uh, finally, when going from boost converter to totem pole PFC, again extends the applicable power range for a given RDS on device. Even though we covered only PFC topologies in this brief presentation, we do have similar tables for other popular topologies where GAN devices are used. So thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in learning more about our devices, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to assist you. Thank you.